Tonight we're in Buxton. Welcome to Question Time. On tonight's panel, James Cleverly, former Brexit minister under Theresa May, a Leave campaigner in the EU referendum, now chairman of the Conservative Party. A member of the Labour Party since the age of 19, she worked for the housing charity Shelter and the NHS before being elected as an MP in 2017, Labour's shadow housing minister Sarah Jones. Minette Batters, the first female president of the National Farmers Union, raised on a farm and now runs her own family farm in Wiltshire. Sasha Lord, co-founder of the Parklife Music Festival and a series of rave nights known as the Warehouse Project. In 2018, he was appointed Greater Manchester's first nightlife czar and comedian, writer and guest on shows such as Mock the Week and The Mash Report, Jeff Norcott. to our panel, to the audience here and of course to you at home and don't forget you can join in the conversation please do on social media at BBC Question Time. Right, let's get started with our first question from Jack Hadfield. Okay, thank you. Um, should the Department of Transport and the Treasury shoulder the majority of the blame for the failures of Northern Rail? So Northern Rail, which I imagine rather a lot of you use here in the audience since uh, it, it is the only line I think you can use from, from Buxton. Um, Sarah, do you want to kick us off on that? Of course, it's just been taken back into government control. It has. Uh, they're renationalising it. It's good to see that they're um, following our lead. Um, the government has has no rail strategy. Chris Grayling, we remember, uh, famously said, "I'm not in charge of the of the trains." Um, and. Uh, most of you will have suffered under Northern Rail and most of us have suffered under the rail network as we find it now. This is the second line now that the government have decided to renationalise. They're only doing it in a temporary way, but the question is, why did it take so long? We knew it was rubbish for a long time before they acted, so why didn't they act faster? And what reassurances have they put in place, well none yet, that will say actually we will stop the delays, we will reinvest in the, in, uh, the infrastructure and we will make sure we get a better deal for customers. And for me, you know, rail nationalisation makes sense partly because it's actually quite simple. There's no assets you have to buy back when the franchises come up. You can take them back into public control and you can say, right, let's put customers first. Let's put service first, security first, safety first, and let's make sure we run uh, the rail companies, you know, in the, way that, um, in the way that works for us and not just for those privatised companies. So I think, why didn't they do it before? Why has it taken so long? Why don't we go further? Right, well, look, James, I'll come to you in a moment. Sasha, I just want to come to you first. As, as Manchester's nightlife guru. I've, I've just realised, am I the only northerner on the, uh, the panel as well? Well, we've got an so, audience clearly full of them. Obviously. Anyway. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I mean, for me, uh, you know, uh, the defranchising is absolutely welcomed. Um, it is long, long overdue. I think the difference between London transport and the transport in the north is an absolute disgrace. I think it's like comparing the Premiership in, in London to the Vauxhall Conference League. Um, our, our Metro mayors in the north, Andy Burnham, Steve Rotherham, on a daily basis have been complaining to the government. Um, I know people who have lost their jobs because they've been waiting for these old trains to turn up, they're cancelled, they turn up late, they're consistently late for work, and when they do get on them, they're overcrowded. Um, it's not right. Why does a bus in London cost a pound? A bus in Manchester costs four pounds. There's an inter a great, fantastic integrated transport system in London that's capped at £10. In Greater Manchester, you can spend £20 to £30 in the daytime. It's not fair, and I think it's, it's great that we are seeing a slight sign that the government are listening to what we in Greater Manchester and Buxton and Gloss have, have been asking for. And it's about time. It's long, long overdue. James, is how much should uh, the Department of Transport and the Treasury, so how much should the government shoulder the majority of the blame for failures of Northern Rail? I mean, Northern Rail has just been renationalised, re as we know. Um, there are those who argue that the timetable that was set for Northern Rail by the government was undeliverable, the infrastructure wasn't there, the new railway lines weren't there, the updates at Manchester Piccadilly just weren't there in order for Northern Rail. I'm not saying they've done everything right, but in order for Northern Rail, for example, to deliver that timetable back in June 2018, wasn't it, when you know, the vast, uh, hundreds of trains were cancelled in a day? Well, 
It's absolutely right that the, uh, the government has taken Northern Rail, uh, or is in the process of taking Northern Rail back into uh, public ownership, public management. Um, but because how, much do you, how much do you take the blame for what's happened at Northern Rail? Well, um, I think we should uh, remind ourselves that the, uh, the franchising of our rail network has seen record uh, levels of uh, investment, record increases in passenger numbers. Um, uh, we are, the government's now committed to extending the rail network so it reaches more parts of the country. Northern Rail has not worked. And that is why Northern Rail is being brought back uh, into, into public ownership. And do you think um, the government has any role in Northern Rail not working? That's the question. Well, the government always has a role to play in a public transport network. But for the vast majority of the rail network in the country, we have seen, as I say, increased passenger numbers, increased investment, new rolling stock. That has not happened in Northern Rail. The pace of trains are long, long past their sell-by date. The Prime Minister made it clear when he was campaigning that that would be resolved. And I'm very pleased to see that he is once again delivering on the promises made during his leadership campaign, the promises we made during the general election campaign, and we are getting a grip on what has been a failing service. Right. Let's, quite a few hands up. Let's get round the audience. Yes, you, sir. Um, I've been a Northern Rail customer, if you want to call it that, for the last sort of three to four years. Uh, what would you call it? A disgrace. Um, <laughs> it, it's probably the polite term. Um, uh, the first thing I do in the morning when my alarm goes off is check which train's cancelled and whether I'm going to get to work on time. And that's not a sob story, that's true. Um, I think it, I agree, Sasha, if this was south of the border, it would have been fixed yesterday. I think as commuters, we welcome it, but what's going to happen in the next two, three years now? You know, how long is the change going to come? Are we going to see an immediate change or is it, we going to have to wait even longer for that? OK. In the, in the, um... Yes, I'd like to take you to task on the when you say there's more investment in the railways. My sons work in London. Um, they go to St Pancras on a Friday night. The last ticket he bought was £160 and he didn't get a seat. Now, it's almost impacting on family life now that families can't go around the country and be transported on your railway network because of the overcrowding, the expense, the delays, the cancellations, is an absolute joke. Okay. The railway network is a joke. No, 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 no. Spend per capita in the north of England on public transport is two and a half times less that than in London. How can that be justified? Okay. The woman there with the yellow scarf. I'd like to ask James cleverly what specifically we are going to see by way of changes yes. and when. Yeah. What will be different and when will we see it? All right. Well, James, I'm going to come around the rest of the panel, but let you be able to come back in on this. So we've had 10 years, more or less, of Conservative government. This woman's calling the railway service a disgrace, and at least two people said, what's going to be different and when will it be different? Well, I, um, the announcement's only just come out. I can't, and I, 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 I'm not in the position to give you... Uh, the kind of detail that you're asking for at the moment. But the reason the government has taken it uh, in-house is because uh, it, we have listened to the anger and the complaints from people that use this service, and we are responding uh, to that. The Prime Minister has said, right, enough is enough. You've had enough second chances, um, no more excuses. We are taking this off you. We are going to make improvements. We're going to make sure there is new rolling stock, and we're going to make sure it services the people that rely on it for work and, uh, and uh, to get, you know, to, to see family, whatever reason you might use uh, for a train service. And the gentleman who said that the, the differential between transport investment in the south of the country and the north of the country is completely out of kilter is absolutely right. This is one of the big lessons that I think politicians should have learnt a number of years ago when millions of people... What, within the last in, 10 years? When millions of people in the country said, we are not happy with the status quo, the Conservative Party very much took that lesson on board, which is why uh, we are taking a very different approach to regional policy and making sure we increase the investment in the north of England. So are you going in to trans level it up, James? Absolutely, we're going to level it up. The Prime Minister made that commitment, and this is the first of a number of a delivery on the promises that we made. Yeah, for me, you know, we're talking about trains. It's not just poor trains in the north, it's poor transport in general. Now, we sat here in Buxton. Buxton is an absolute bottleneck um, for traffic. It's, it's an absolute nightmare, and I'm sure you're all aware of that. 
I was amazed at the fact today that I heard two major cities, Manchester and Sheffield, had the poorest connection between the two cities in the whole of Europe, but they're major cities. So it, it needs looking at, it needs looking at quickly. And I think, you know, we need to be giving more powers to people locally. The people in Westminster don't know what's best for people in Greater Manchester. We need more powers in Greater Manchester. So, for example, our, our mayor in Greater Manchester, the mayor in Liverpool, the mayor in Newcastle, they need the powers. They know what is right for the buses. They know what's right for the trains. We need to have more power devolved up here. Minette? Well, look, on behalf of the, the members that I represent, which is 47,000 farmers across England and world, a lot of them living in, in very rural communities, public transport absolutely vital for them. And I would very much agree with, with what Sasha says and the gentleman in the, in the blue at the back. You know, I think this has been London-centric. We've had a two-tier uh, public transport system. And it is failing, and it is failing very many parts of the country that need it most. So we have to prioritise the investment. I think it's great that it is being brought back in-house. But, you know, we cannot carry on with this two-tier system. And I think this is a lot of the problems with, with Brexit and everything else. People feel that everything has been driven by London, and London is just out of touch with rural parts of the country, particularly here in Buxton, a very rural part of the country. And, and they, people feel let down and disadvantaged. Jeff Norcott. Yeah, I think it's interesting, this sort of predicted far-right Boris Johnson government and one of the first acts is to, <laughs> to nationalise uh, a rail provider. So, in fairness, I've given a lot of stick to Jeremy Corbyn over the years. This is an area in which maybe he won the argument. You know, a lot of Conservative voters see an argument for nationalisation. I'm a little bit uncomfortable about governments getting too involved and you sort of hope that it's temporary. But as, as Sasha brought up there, the ridiculous thing in this country is the north to south links are the ones that are always looked at. But if you want to go side to side... Yeah. There's some sort of weird prejudice against that. You might as well just get a mule. Almost um, everybody <laughs> is nodding their heads here in the what, audience. What is the issue? What's the prejudice against side to side? And you look at services, you know, connecting like Manchester and Sheffield, that Trans, Trans Pennine Express, a brilliant staff and a heroic commitment to buffet carts on even a single carriage train. However, <laughs> however, I think, you know, you talk about connecting the north with London. How about connecting the north with the north? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, look, let's pick up on that point. Let's follow up what you're saying, uh, Jeff. Julie Ollenshaw, where are you? Is HS2 the best way to spark infrastructure revolution? Well, so there's been a bit of a meeting today, hasn't there, with uh, Boris Johnson, with the Transport Secretary, uh, Grant Shapps, and with the Chancellor, Sajid Javid. Uh, were you there, James? No, I was on my way here on a pacer train trying to... And, uh, <laughs> actually, when we were on our way here, our train was cancelled, but there we go. Yeah, I couldn't so, get on the first train yeah. uh, because it was um, overcrowded. So, so I, feel, I feel your pain. I feel um, your pain. Uh, when are we going to hear? What are we going to hear? Soon. I don't know what we're going to hear. The Okavi Review uh, is looking at the, uh, the whole situation around HS2, uh, the costs and the sequencing and that kind of stuff. Um, so and is anyone, I, anyone dissenting in the Cabinet? Um, the cabinet, uh, the, the way cabinets work, and the Prime Minister is really making this very clear, is that we come to a collective decision uh, in private, and then once we have come to a collective decision, that is uh, the decision of the whole cabinet, the whole government. So we'll not be quite so the, uh, uh, seen will, that in quite a long time. I know, time. I know, but uh, things are changing under the new Prime Minister and changing for the better. So um, you, and but you're, you personally are in favour, aren't you? Well, I think it's absolutely key. I think it's absolutely key, and. It's, Jeff was saying, I think there's unanimity on the panel here, that um, big parts of the country, particularly in the north of, of England, have not been as well serviced by public transport and other things as they should be. And making sure that that is addressed is absolutely a priority. HS2 is one of the options. Obviously, there are concerns about some of the cost projections about that, and that will need to be looked at. Um, but... Um, the, the broader point I want to make is that the government is absolutely committed to making sure that the whole of the country and every community within the country is properly connected and can feel the benefit of the growth in the UK economy. Okay. Julie, you asked the question. What's your view? I, I think we're better to be able to cross the country by Northern Rail than the HS2 and the amount of money and by the time it gets to the north, whether it will be obsolete. Right, there's a man here in the front with the check shirt. I think there's a, a brilliant missed opportunity to connect Derby with Buxton and therefore Nottingham Derby with Manchester by 
reopening the Monsell Trail. It's 12 miles long. Um, it probably wouldn't cost as much as HS2. Uh, and, 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 that, and that is a whole part of, you know, you can get a connection from Lincoln to Nottingham, and that would connect the east with the north. Sarah, HS2, is that the best way to, to spark infrastructure revolution? That's what Judy's asking. Well, I think we wouldn't probably be starting from this point, but the, 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 the issue with HS2 is it's been going now for 10 years. We've spent something like nine billion. I mean, a huge amount of money. Two thousand people are working on HS2. Yeah, seven billion um, already spent. You, seven billion, um, and and you know there is already work underway. It's it's not like we're starting from scratch. So I think we have to go for this. This country is really bad at finishing large infrastructure projects. So we have to do this, but not at the expense of everything else and I mean we had an announcement two years ago from the government that they were going to reopen all of the tracks that had been closed by the beaching review so 5,000 miles worth of tracks that we were promised they've I'm now sure you did promise that I'm did not, you they did no, it was 500 no, really million uh, yeah, so promised, funding to help restore some yeah, of the railway so they've, lines they've promised, I, let me come to this they've promised 500 million pounds I'm told that will get you between 25 and 50 miles worth of track so the tracks that were closed in this area are they going to be reopened or not are we going to be looking at, at some of those replacements and also there's a big review going on in the moment in the Department of Transport about um, uh, whether or not we have a whole new system of the rail network but it's taking a very long time they're doing it kind of piecemeal you go Go into the Department of Transport and there's one person that deals with that franchise, one person that deals with that franchise, one person deals with... None of them ever talk to each other. None of them can do anything. I did a project once on ticketing. Try and get a ticket that gets you from one place to another cheap as possible. It's, it's, it's virtually impossible because the system doesn't work. So yes, we need to do HS2. Yes, we need to do far more in terms of infrastructure development because we're, we're running on Victorian lines at the moment and we need to expect more. You know, our country is, is our, our transport system is a bit of an embarrassment compared to other European countries. So we really do need to step up and invest. <laughs> Who in the audience here supports uh, the building of HS2? Uh, yes, sir, you put your hand up then. Absolutely, we need to start uh, increasing the connectivity to the north. But the question that was asked earlier, which hasn't been answered, is the cost to the individual user. It's a huge disincentive to use the railways when it costs £250 for an open return from Macclesfield to London. It's a scandalous amount of money, and as a lady said earlier, you may or you may not get a seat for that price. Mm. Sasha? As of, just no. coming back to Julie's question as of HS2. Yeah, no, it's a great question, Julie, and I fully support <laughs> HS2. Um, it has to go to Manchester. So e even though we don't know how much it's going to cost. I mean, well, that, this, billion this, possibly, this, but we, this is we don't the thing know. that I cannot get my head around um, from a business point of view. Somebody or a department has been paid a lot of money to sit down and budget HS2. They came up with £38 billion, then they came up with 60 odd billion, and now it's just nearer 100 billion. How can somebody get something so wrong? That's, I just find, unfathomable. Jeff? Yeah, I mean, the way that quote's going up, it sounds like you must be using the same builder that I use, you know? <laughs> just keeps going, oh no, that'll be under. Is, is it true, James, that part, part of this uh, expanding price is because they've asked uh, the procurers, the procurement policy, to look across such a big time frame, like 25 years. And I just wonder, you know, if that's where the wiggle room is and Boris straps on his cape and perhaps they slightly change the rubric for procurement, maybe freeing up money to deliver greater services in the north. But you're supporting as far as you're concerned, HS2. Oh, no, I just, what I worry about is, is if not HS2, then what? You know, and I do think that there is a problem in this country that there's not, and with all respect to people watching from Birmingham, but if you look at the, the population and the, the significance of London, this country is unlike any others. In Spain, you've got Madrid and Barcelona, you know, you've got New York and Chicago. London skews the whole of the country. So it has to be done, just not at any cost. Minette, what's your view on this? You're a, think, fan, you're a support of HS2? Um, well, I think the point that Julie makes is absolutely fundamental. Is it, is it the best return on investment, or would that investment be better made in Northern Rail and delivering on a much broader basis? Um, for farmers, this has been absolutely huge. This has been ongoing for 10 years. We've had land that's been compulsory purchased. We've had houses that have been compulsory purchased. In many cases, that has not, that transaction has not been completed. Those farmers have not been paid for that. They have sacrificed businesses. I've had farmers with tears in their eyes who have had to close their farm shop 
close all their diversification wedding businesses and 10 years and still not knowing. So that's been a massive issue. We've also, I think, got to look at infrastructure and investment and where it goes. This is going through historic, ancient woodland that is irreplaceable. And the damage to nature and the environment on the back of that doesn't seem to be talked about nearly enough. We will not replace it with like for like. We do the same with house building. We don't prioritise grade one land for where we're going to produce food. And I think going forwards with the challenges of climate change, we've really got to prioritise infrastructure and we've got to talk about food production, we've got to talk about nature and we've got to be responsible right across society. So do you think it should go ahead or not? Um, is it going to deliver on the return on investment? And I think so many people don't know. The other thing, so many people don't know the ancient woodlands that it's going to go through. So many people don't know uh, about the, the businesses that it has destroyed and what those farmers in uh, that part of the country feel in Warwickshire and Staffordshire at the moment is they need an ombudsman to represent them and to make the case. It has been 10 years. I mean, we're all for progress. So, you, so, you, so as, as a union, you haven't take a view on, taken a view on this yet in terms of representing farmers? We've absolutely taken a view on it to represent those farmers and make sure their concerns are heard. But nobody has known whether this is actually going to happen or not, and it's destroyed lives in its wake. So I think we just have to look at infrastructure, where it's going to go in, in the whole round. And I think the point that Julie makes is, is that investment not better into Northern Rail as a whole, delivering on a much wider basis, rather than just into HS2 with all the ramifications that you get on the back of that? OK. Now, I get the feeling... And, and look at your face and hands up that we could talk about rail all night. <laughs> <laughs> but let's not do that, because you put lots of other questions in as well. So I'm going to move on. But before I do, I just want to say that next week we will be in Harpenden, in Hertfordshire, and the week after that we're in Dundee, where we will be joined by the crime writer Val McDermott. So if you want to be in the audience, call 0330 123 99 88 or go to the Question Time website and you can follow the instructions there. So do come and join us in either of those locations. Right, let's get off rail, for now anyway. Let's hope we're all going to get back later. Um, Jen Jennifer Murphy. Hi. <coughs> Is it really safe to fly anyone out of Wuhan back to the UK, given the severity of the coronavirus? So, Jennifer, would you rather that we didn't, that we left them there? Honestly. Yeah, I think I would. I think they should be quarantined there. I don't think, given it's like a plague, it seems. I don't know the severity or the mortality rate, and does it kill everybody who's affected? I don't know. I think they should stay there. Well, it's not killing everyone affected, no, because it, it, thousands of people have been infected and, and over 100 people have, have died. But no, it certainly hasn't. Otherwise, we'd be looking at about 7,000 people dead, and that would, well, I can't even imagine that. Um, Jeff, leave him there. <laughs> it's quite. I'm really hoping you'd come to me on this. Um, yeah, it is one of these things that kind of, these news stories that, that ticks over. So I'm, I'm going to do the thing that I, when I'm watching Question Time, I often think, you don't know what you're talking about, mate. Let someone else have a go. So I'll keep it really brief and say that... <laughs> I'll keep it really Good brief for you. And say, no one's ever no. said that in my entire yeah. time on Fashion <laughs> yeah. you know what? So, Do you think we know what we're talking about? No, I just, I'll leave this one to the politicians. i just say one good thing, I think, is that, you know, where is this an issue where China has historically sometimes been a bit guarded in this respect? They're sort of being quite open. I think that's yeah. constructive, but I'll let the experts yeah. take over. OK. There's a woman... You're looking quite exercised about it with your pink scarf on. I can't quite understand what's going on because, um, first of all, we're told that there's going to be self-isolation. Secondly, we're told that there's quarantine. Yes, there's going to be a hospital or a facility in the world. Then we're told that they're going to come back by plane together, go in a military building, to which they're going to be together until there's a symptom that appears. And, so, and also, what's going to happen in the aeroplane with the air conditioning when the 200 people come back together? Um, I'm just a bit concerned about these people coming back. Well, in case, in case if there's one infected person on the plane, it will infect that, everybody that, else. That will infect the whole plane. Um, and also, apparently, since um, January, um, there's 1,200, 1,500 that have actually come back from, Japan, uh, from China, um, Huan, and um, only a few have been trackable. So yeah. where are these people and are the public at risk? I don't know. Well, we haven't had an outbreak yet, have we? But I, I have to. No, but, no. but that's but not I to believe say that it we was won't. Fergus Walsh that was on television saying it, and it was also um, in the papers about the amount. Right. In the newspapers, in the Guardian and the Telegraph. Um, Sasha, should we be flying people back? 
At, I mean, we've, well, we've seen lots of people on, on, on the news who are desperate to come home, obviously. So, on, on that, I'm, I'm not qualified to answer Jennifer's question. What I did find out, actually, last week, which is a fact I never knew, is Wuhan is actually twinned with Manchester, um, which is a, a fact for the evening. <coughs> um, I think the government did a really, really poor job, actually, when, when the news first broke. So, there's nine million people on lockdown. Uh, to give you an idea, Greater Manchester's 2.8 million, Scotland's 5 million, so that puts everything into perspective. And their advice was to get out of the area. When it's under lockdown and there's no public transport and you can't drive and you've got people who are watching on the news panicking for their lives, Skyping interviews over, how are you supposed to get out? And uh, I've seen today now there is a plane there and they're looking at bringing... Well, people are coming... People have been flown people back tonight, 150 flown back, uh, to the world. But I just think it was um, too little, too late, to be honest. Um, we should have followed examples of other countries. Right, so we should certainly be flying about, but maybe more quickly. Yes, the, the woman with the glasses. Hello, um, I'm a GP locally, and um, with regards to the coronavirus, I think the government have done a good job. Um, I've got a brilliant amount of information from them very, very quickly. What I think the problem is, is the press. I think they're scaremongering. I don't think they give the correct information. <laughs> Obviously, well, yes, hopefully Fergus, my colleague Fergus, is doing a reasonable job. What about what the lady was saying there about everyone coming back on the plane and will, it, will, everyone, will, will they end up infecting each other? I mean, it's an incredibly contagious um, form of a flu virus, essentially, and um, what nobody ever talks about is the military staff and the medical staff, they are likely to be carriers and be going to infect people, but where are they going? Right, there's almost as many questions as we've got answers here. Um, Sarah? Oh, um, I mean, the 150 people are flying back tonight, um, possibly as we speak. Yeah. Was this the right move? Yeah. I mean, again, I, I wouldn't claim to be an expert. I think the point about China doing the right thing this time is, is absolutely right. They've been much more open. And I think, you know, um, uh, I'm not making a point about Brexit at all. I'm just saying when we leave, we need to make sure we've got those cross-government, cross-country working together because actually you know this has no um, uh, borders i think there has been criticism of the government in that they have been a bit slower to act than other countries i think the the information that people have have got has been um and maybe it's the government's fault maybe it's it's the public health uh, role to to get that information out but you know are people being screened aren't they are people being brought back aren't they we've all heard interviews on the radio of people who are in wuhan who are trying to come back who feel like they're on their own and they, they aren't getting the help they need. But do you think it's the right thing to bring them back? I think, That's of course, if, if, if we can, I think the quarantine is, is, is what we're doing right. and that's a sensible approach. Okay. I would say that, um, you know, we, we do public health really well in this country, but there has been a huge cut to the budgets uh, and our diplomatic service is, is at a 20-year low in terms of funding. So the embassy, in, you know, in, in China they'll be struggling uh, with our public health approach, we'll be, we'll be struggling because, because we don't have the resources that we once had. But I think as a country we tend to be quite good at managing these kind of crises and, and, and you know, we, need, we all need to make sure we're not trying to scaremonger. A lot of flights now have been cancelled coming in and out of the whole of China. There's a lot of people in the whole of China that might need to come back. And if this escalates quickly, we need to know what is the government plan. Right, and it's just been declared a global emergency by the World Health Organization tonight. Uh, and Minette, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking from a National Farmers Union perspective, I'm not entirely sure what your, 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 your view on this was, but, but Jennifer's point was she, you don't feel it is a good idea to fly people back despite the pleading that we've been hearing over, over the airways over the last few days. Uh, Jennifer, I, look, I, I absolutely sympathise with that, but I think if you or I were out there, we'd probably be pretty desperate to come, okay. to come back. Um, you know, it's, it's a really complex virus. It's a zoonosis, so it can jump from uh, animal to human, and it just shows how different, effectively, China is to here. So this was at a, a wet market in Wuhan, where they bring in live animals, so they have snakes, marmots, um, bats. They very much the feeling is this jumped from a bat to a domestic animal, and that was how it passed on to humans. So I think there are there are big lessons actually to be learned in how these things uh, spread, how these zoonosis viruses spread, how they mutate, um, and it's a real lesson, I guess, in, in whole, the whole standards piece. You know, China had that horrendous outbreak. Uh, whereby they had contaminated baby milk and they put 56,000 babies into hospital. 
And so we've got to, I think, learn from what has happened. And I'm sure the Chinese, the Chinese seem to have reacted really, really quickly to all of this. But they will have big, big lessons to learn on the back of this, that if you have live animals, wild animals, uh, coming into markets where there is food being sold, this is how these things can jump. And it's enormously dangerous. And now we have you know, a global situation on the back of it, on the back, potentially, of one bat. And then with this hand up, yes. This links into exactly what you were saying. Um, how can the UK and the international community pressurise China into closing down these wet markets that deal in endangered species and cr create these zoonotic viruses which jump species? How can we actually pressurise them to close them down and stop it happening again? Because we've had this one, the corona, SARS and avian flu. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the woman here in the, fr in the front with the glasses. Yeah, just wondering, after the people have been in quarantine for the two weeks, what happens if they caught the virus while they were there within the two weeks? Right. Are they going to be monitored after they've been in quarantine? Right, so James, I'm sure you've been briefed up to the gills on this subject <laughs> since the, the flight is going out tonight or has already left uh, with these people. So, so what is going to happen? So 150 people are coming back, uh, 50 from other EU countries. They're going to this place in the Wirral where they're going to stay for two weeks and then what? Well, uh, firstly, the simple answer to your question, Jennifer, is yes, it is absolutely right we bring these people home. We have a responsibility and we are making good on that responsibility. We're lucky in the UK that we have some genuine world-class experts in uh, disease management. Um, and uh, when, um, you know, when these things happen, the people involved in this have done exercises, they've practiced their procedures, they've... Uh, practice um, the, the, the GP uh, doctor I didn't catch your name I do apologize um, uh, is right we disseminate information to medical practitioners so they know what to expect they know the parameters um, and the uh, and the uh, the isolation that we're putting people into will be designed specifically to make sure that before people are uh, uh, you know, allowed back into wider community they are no longer a, a, a medical risk. These things are done incredibly professionally and as I say we should as a country be very very proud that we have got some very experienced practitioners uh, in, in this and we've exercised uh, um, uh, flu, uh, we've, we had that um, fantastic response, my mother was from Sierra Leone, we had that fantastic response to uh, Ebola in West Africa that I think we can be incredibly proud of. This is incredibly scary, I, I completely understand that and it's legitimate that people are worried, but we are global experts in dealing with this kind of thing. And the fact the Chinese have been very open, that they've communicated with the international community, they're sharing information, I think is to their credit, and has helped the global medical community deal with what is a very, very so, concerning situation. So what can we all expect to happen now, in that it's now a coronavirus now in every region in China, it's now been declared a global emergency by the World Health Organization, which brings with it uh, certain um, procedures that may now follow, such as, for example, stopping all flights to China, um, you know, extraordinary though that, that may sound. What can we expect to follow now? Uh, I, I'm not going to speculate. I don't... Uh, I think we all agree on the panel. I, I don't pretend to know enough about uh, the procedures... No, because in terms and, of government policy. Well, as I say, I, I'm not going to speculate because this is, where, this is one of these areas where we do have experts, um, medical experts who are experienced, they're practised, um, they, have, they have done ex uh, training exercises uh, around this kind of thing, um, and we will, uh, we will rely on those experts to use the experience that they've, uh, they've got to uh, guide uh, government policy and, uh, and our reaction. But the point I would say is the headlines around these things can be incredibly disconcerting. Um, but we, we are, as I say, amongst the best in the world at dealing with these kind of things. OK, let's... Um, there's another subject which we've got a lot of questions about this evening. Because, of course, tonight is Thursday, tomorrow... Yeah, yeah. It's Friday. What happens tomorrow? <laughs> My goodness. Do you know, I spent all last year talking about it on this programme. It could hardly fit in another subject. Tomorrow is Brexit Day. Tax return. So... <laughs> got mine in already, I mean, I'm being pretty late if you leave until tomorrow. Um, Jonathan Hodson, whereabouts are you? Oh. Are those that voted Remain Mardi or justified in trying to curtail <laughs> celebrations tomorrow? <laughs> What's your view, Jeff? 
I'm just glad we can move forward now. I think the general election gave 650 MPs <coughs> a grow-up tablet. So I was sick of the bickering. Uh, if we'd have um, Im implemented the uh, result that was um, given in the referendum, we'd be far further ahead as a country now. And would you like to see big celebrations tomorrow? I'm not bothered about the celebrations. I'm glad we've now got some direction and businesses, entrepreneurs and people like that can move this country forward. Well, Jeff, look, I'm going to come to you. So, so Jonathan's question, are those who voted Remain being Mardi? Or are they, which I love. Uh, I love yeah, that word. I'm with, I'm with Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, is the, I, in a weird way, the Remainers that did the stockpile are in the best position to throw a party. You know, they've, got all the, they've got all the food, they've got the drugs. <laughs> this is Jonathan, not so, Jeff, incidentally, but anyway, small point. Probably Jeff is with Jonathan, but we get, we get the idea. Got the point. Listen, I think that it's interesting, and now it feels oddly chilled out in, in a strange way. I mean, it almost feels like, I remember that film, The Truman Show, where it just sort of finished and everyone started watching something else. And I'm glad that we're at that point because there's been so much rancor over the years and I think the vast majority of people lean one way or the other. And weirdly at this point, I'm sort of thinking back to referendum day because we've all got lost in other arguments that maybe we weren't thinking about at the time. And I, I didn't go there with any ill will in my heart. I went there, I wasn't thinking about empire, you know. I wasn't, thinking, I wasn't feeling anything xenophobic. I, was, uh, I definitely wasn't thinking about blue passports. But, um, but they are the best colour for a passport, but that's another issue. I was, I just wanted, I was offered the chance for Britain to end a political relationship that had changed drastically since we joined the EU, um, and I took it. And I think it's going to be okay, and I know people might scoff at that sort of optimism, but, you know, consumer confidence, business morale are genuine things. And, I, I, you know, I'll go on record, this will probably be the sort of thing that will bite me on the backside, but I think the, the economy will really motor this year. I think that the jobs market will remain buoyant. I think England are going to win Euro 2020. <laughs> I, and, and look, I make, no apologies. I make no apologies for being optimistic. Right. Sarah. <laughs> Somehow I just forget you're not feeling quite the same. Is this a moment for celebration or is well, nothing else coming together? Well, I've got um, nine-year-old twin boys and they've got five football mates coming over for a sleepover tomorrow night. So I am going to spend the night we leave the European <laughs> Union locked in my bedroom drinking a glass of wine with seven boys uh, running about my house. So, um, but it is, it is a really important moment. And I think we need to recognise both sides of, um, uh, of this Brexit debate. For many people, being part of the European Union meant something very important to them. It meant something about partnership. It meant something about progress. It meant something about having that voice that meant we could say no to those big global powers if we needed to because we stood together. And, that, and we need to recognise that. That's what I felt too about being in the European Union. But, you know, there was always that gap where there were people that didn't feel that way and they didn't believe that that's what the European Union was and so here we are and we're leaving and um, whilst I won't be celebrating I think that, that both sides you know leavers felt they didn't recognize their country anymore and remainers now are thinking I want to salvage what I love of, from my country we, we all want our country back right that's what that's what that's where we are we want to move forward I think the the, 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 the way I would disagree with what you were saying is that there's a lot more that we need to unpick here. We have no idea what our immigration strategy is going to be. Government's tying itself in knots already over the trade uh, relationship. We don't know uh, what kind of deal we're going to get by the end of the year. It's probably going to be a very uh, small one. We, we're probably not going to fix the services. We've got the problem with Northern Ireland. Actually, the economy has already taken quite a beating over the last few years. You know, there are problems here. But I think the last thing I would say is Boris Johnson, I think, might have been the the man to kind of win the Brexit war, but I don't know if he's the man to, to bring the peace. Do you know what I mean? He's, he's not necessarily the man who's going to put in the hard graft to get this done. He's not necessarily a man that wants to bring people together. You know, he's never talked about levelling up the country until, you know, he, he, he won some seats in the north of the country, and, and I worry about that. But I think that's, but why, I think that's, we all, that's why he But I think I share your optimism end. about my country, because I love my country, and I think we're all brilliant. But, you know, this is a moment where we, we do need to come together. The woman at the back then, with the dark hair. I, I was a Remainer. I voted Remain. I am hugely relieved that a decision has been made and we're moving forward. I think it's given an incredible sign, as Jeff said, for business and confidence has been boosted and I hope that we're going to have an incredibly prosperous year as a result. And what will you be doing tomorrow night? Anything? Probably having a glass of wine. <laughs> glass of wine. The woman in front, just a bit further forward with the... Further forward again with the blonde hair, yes. 
As a student who's looking to do a year abroad next year through the Erasmus scheme, whilst I welcome all the celebrations and everything, it's quite a worrying time for us at the moment because we don't know what's going on, because obviously the deal will come at the end of the year. Is there any certainty that you can put out to students who are looking to do a year abroad that our grants will be uh, secure, that we are actually going to be able to go on these opportunities because we are applying and this could all change by the summer, so we might not even be accepted to the partner universities? Uh, James, I'll come back to you on that in a moment, if I may. Uh, Minette, um, from your perspective, it's tomorrow a day of celebration or at the very least of coming together? You know, I've had about five hours sleep in the last three days, so I'm, I'm going to be hopefully unconscious. Um, but look, <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope that's because you've been partying in a kind of fashion. <laughs> <type style. laughs> I wish. Um, look, uh, it, it, for us, it's now about you know this has been democratic. We're leaving. The prime minister has a really, really strong mandate now, which is good because it concludes things and we can move on. But this is about getting Brexit right. We've done effectively the easy bit. We've signed off the withdrawal agreement and we're going. We're leaving tomorrow. But now we have to focus on getting Brexit right. And for us, that is all about trade. For each and every one of you in this room, yeah. that is all about the food that you will be eating. It's about maintaining our standards of animal welfare. It's about maintaining our standards of environmental protection. We've got to get Brexit right. We have a, a once in a lifetime chance to design our own trade policy, our own. And that lies, the responsibility of that lies with this government. And huge pressure on them, but I do think we need to work in partnership, we need to shape it, and we need to be really clear about what we want. And I just say it's very interesting that Witch, who is effectively the voice of consumers, has said standards must be maintained no matter what. Price is important, choice is important, consumer rights are important, but nothing, but nothing at the expense of standards. And they go on to say, that 70% of consumers really have no idea about trade policy, have no idea about how this will impact on the food in our fridges. Mm. So there's huge responsibility on us to challenge government, to work with government, to make sure this isn't about getting Brexit done, it's about getting Brexit right. Brexit is done, we're leaving, let's make sure we get it right for everybody in this room. OK. We may come back to that in a bit more detail in a moment, actually. Um, Sasha? No, are you planning think... some huge rave tomorrow night? I don't know. As, as Manchester's tomorrow... night life is all. Uh, I think it's going to be very muted. Um, you know, I, we're entering this transition period. The student there that mentioned 12 months, I don't think the transition period will be finished in 12 months. I really don't. <laughs> but for me, tomorrow will bring on slight relief. For three and a half years, we've had this cloud over us of negativity, of, of hatred. And I think we've actually lost sight on local matters that really do matter. For example, across the whole of the UK, there's a big homelessness issue. We're very lucky in Greater Manchester that the Bed Every Night campaign, we've seen a reduction in homelessness of 37%. We've booked all major UK cities. Um, but we need to be looking at that. We need to be looking at NHS. We've got a problem with knife crime. And I think once this is out of the way, tomorrow we can concentrate on issues that really matter locally. So I, I'm, I'm quite relieved about it. Regarding the nighttime economy, um, you know, James, I, I, know you, I know you got a degree in hospitality, actually. Yeah. And, you know, speaking to, to people who work within the nighttime economy in, in hospitality, especially in hotels, there's so many Europeans who do not know what's going to happen over the next 12 months. There's so much uncertainty. Likewise, in the NHS, there's so much uncertainty. And I just, you know, I would, I'm, I'm watching it with interest, what's going to happen. Um, but for me, it's, it's going to create slight relief. So, James, so there's a number of things to pick up. And the original question was, was from Jonathan about are, are Remainers being marred and trying to kind of, or being killed, joys about celebrations tomorrow night. I noticed that Nigel Farage has complained that his, his bash at, in um, Parliament Square, he's not allowed to have fireworks, music or alcohol. <laughs> Doesn't sound much like a party to me. But anyway, um, no party I particularly would want to go to. Um, on that basis, are you, are you trying to not celebrate too much tomorrow? Are you trying well, to kind of ride two horses? Because obviously this has been an utter triumph for the government in that sense, but equally you don't want to look triumphalist. And of course you had serious questions about, for students for example, and from Sasha. So what I would say is, if you want to celebrate tomorrow night, then do so, have fun, have fun. But I would also say, if you know people for whom this is not a moment of celebration, don't rub their noses in it. Because the, the big thing about this 
is that uh, a question was asked, and it was a question that had been rumbling along below the surface for a very, very long time, and it needed to be resolved. The question was asked, the country answered, everyone promised that they would abide by the decision, turned out that only the Conservative Party meant it. We, were, we uh, ended up having a general election, in large part on this issue, and the question was answered for a second time, which is why tomorrow night we are leaving the European Union. There are people for whom that is worrying, and we are absolutely determined to make sure that if you're a European national in the, in the UK, you know your settled status will be uh, uh, guaranteed. Or if you're a student sure who wants to work you're, to student, study abroad. We've already committed to the Erasmus scheme. Uh, the Prime Minister is an internationalist. He said we are going to be a good global neighbour. We've already said uh, we will maintain animal welfare standards, consumer safety standards, employment standards. So for the people that want to celebrate, for the people for, for whom this is a positive thing, great. You know, in, enjoy tomorrow evening. And for the people who had, or, or still have perhaps, genuine worries about what this change of relationship uh, with uh, uh, the EU will mean, we are absolutely determined to calm your concerns and demonstrate that the UK will be a globally engaged, high standard, uh, a good global player. And we don't need the EU to make us that. We are a wonderful country. And we don't have to be forced to be wonderful because of our membership. And of the what EU. about we protecting standards, as Minette was saying? We've already committed. Yeah. We've, abs we've got some of the highest uh, uh, animal welfare standards in the world. That is not. That is not going to yeah, change. Pompeo, but, the, but the key point is, we're talking about our standards. We've mm. always said we want to maintain our standards. The point is about imports that come into this country. Yeah. Uh, where will that legislation sit? It's not in the agricultural bill, which we have written with. Uh, many farming organisations, 60 environmentalists as well, to the Prime Minister saying, where does that legislation sit? It should be in the Agriculture Bill. Still no reply. So where will the legislation sit? So, the, the, because what, so because otherwise things... we just allow food in that would be illegal to produce here. So one of the things that I've never understood... And if you'll, if you'll indulge me, Fiona, I'm going to do what you get a chance to do, and I've always been a bit envious, so I'd like to do this. I would, uh, like, that... I would like the audience to put their hands up if what they really want, post-Brexit, is a massive reduction in, no, in no, food that, stamps. No, that, that, don't exactly. answer that question, but folks, the, because the, that is not what Minette is no, asking but, but you. That's completely you. changed the argument. She's saying, no, no. why have you not committed so, to maintaining food standards in the Agriculture yeah. Bill? So That's the point, what she's asking. So, the point so why haven't you? So the point I'm making is that now that the British government is fully responsible to the British people for things like trade policy, uh, uh, immigration policy and that kind of stuff, we will respond to the desires of the British people. And there is no desire to scrap our, uh, our animal welfare standards, our food hygiene so standards... So why didn't you put it in the bill? Why didn't you put it in the bill? The simple truth is that British people do not want it to happen, and therefore it will not happen, because this government will respond to the needs and wants of the British people. And that is how a democracy should work. That's what Brexit is all about. So if was, people want was, something, you don't put it in law? Because that's what people want. I'm, I'm very confused about that. But we've got higher animal welfare standards. <laughs> This country, this country, under a Tory, under a Tory uh, Prime Minister, Lord Liverpool, introduced the first animal welfare, the first animal welfare legislation in the world. We are a nation of animal lovers. We are not going to drop our standards. And it's not the EU that forces that upon us. It is what we want to do. And I can't understand why people struggle to understand that. Because you have to legislate it. Yeah. And you have to. You, and you, the woman in the scarf at the back now. Hi. Um, I actually don't think you need to legislate it. I think James is right. I think it needs to be consumer-led. And with education, um, and I don't think this audience needs particularly educating, we all live in the Peak District and we see the animals we eat. Um, if food welfare, nobody's, nobody's going to walk around Tesco's and read the agricultural policy. They're not. And they're not going to look to see what's in legislation and what's not. What they need to see is things that are clearly labelled, not just with a welfare issue, um, on the front cover of a steak. I would love to see uh, where it's come from. I want to see how environmental that farm has been. I want a scoring for that, a scoring for its welfare for that individual, and I want to see the traceability of it. So I want to know exactly what sort of an and animal this, this it is. And this is something you've got experience in? By the sounds of it. Yeah, I'm a farmer, yeah. Um, I would like to see um, 
cows graded in a green way, i.e. a hairy hill cow that's living on the moor that's promoting bird health and insect health, I would like to see that steak being branded as a green hairy cow, <laughs> and as opposed to a mass-produced, factory-produced <laughs> animal. And the same for chicken. I don't, who here would stand up and say, yes, I'm going to eat chlorinated chicken from the United States? They're not. And and actually, let's just that, and we'll buy into it. And is chlorinated chicken definitely not something we are ever going to see? Well, not ever, but we are not going to see in this country as a result of a deal with the US. Um, uh, Michael Gove, when he was environment secretary, said that's not that's 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 not on the table. That's not what we are going to do. But and again, it's, it is a. Asked about this today. Yeah, I know. And you know what? The Americans, the, the American Secretary of State, will try and negotiate the best deal that he can for the Americans. And you know what? If there's things that we don't want in that deal, we'll say so. So no. we're not having chlorinated we'll, chicken. No, of course we're not going to have okay. chlorinated chicken. Okay. Again, hands up who fancies chlorinated chicken. Well, no, but exactly. I'm just asking so that for the government view. So why would why would we want to import a whole load of it, okay. but no one was going to want to eat it? Let's say we've got one more question I'd like to try and squeeze in. We haven't got that much more time. Uh, from uh, Catherine, Catherine Welpton. The average age of owning a mobile phone is becoming younger. Should we be concerned? Now, I assume, Catherine, you're talking about a report that, that, was, uh, that came out today uh, saying that more than half of children, I mean, just more than half of children, own a mobile by the age of seven. Um, Sasha, should we be concerned about that? I don't think it's the mobile phone in itself we should be concerned about. I think it's perhaps the apps on it, the social media. Um, you know, it's not everybody now, it's all about Instagram, it's all about Twitter. Um, and when, I don't know if you have that thing on your phone that tells you how many hours you've spent on it in a, in a week. When that pops up, it's, it's scary. I think more so than the phone, that's what we should be concerned about. Jeff? I, I, I've got a son that's coming up four years old, and if he, he ever sees this, he's not getting a mobile phone by the age of seven. He'll probably have a, dri probably have a driving licence before he has a mobile phone. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, good, can I just say, as a parent, good luck with that. The driving yeah, licence yeah, yeah, yeah. bit. No, I, I'm sorry. Not the four-year-old, but the driving licence bit. I do not understand why a seven-year-old needs a mobile phone. And we all know, we've all got addicted to these things. We all know the potential damage. And one of your job, uh, as a parent, is to say no, and if to say what everyone else has got. I remember if I said to my mum, well, everyone else is doing it, I could tell you the answer she would have given me, right? <laughs> so that is not necessarily um, an end in itself. I think, I, I was, it's rare that I'm shocked by a stat, but over half of kids have got a mobile phone by the age of seven. I think people have just got to stand their ground. Woman in the red top there. <clears throat> As a teacher, obviously we use mobile phones in, in schools or in, in FE and college as I do to actually help the students to find vocabulary, to research things, to be able to find things. And as you've said, it is about being able to use technology in a way forward. Now, I'm pretty sure that most parents probably do give a phone to, to their young children at some point, maybe to keep them busy, maybe to keep them safe if they're walking home somewhere for the first time or they feel that that age but it's about the safety of that child from other people and the element of keeping up with the Joneses. My mm -hmm. friend's got a phone, my other friend's got a phone, everybody else has got one, I want one. We're driving that down so much lower, it's going to make a massive impact. You've got children that are going for meals at age two and three, sat at a table, parents give them a mobile phone to keep them occupied rather than actually engaging in proper conversation, and that's the issue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> your two nine-year-olds, then. Have they got mobiles? They haven't got mobiles. Um, my, so my 10-year-old, um, she's top year primary, she brought me back a list of all the people in her class who had mobile phones. She did her research, like <laughs> about 95% of people had a mobile phone. And the school allow you to take your phone in the top year primary, that's allowed. So you've got the school saying it's okay, you've mm. got all the other kids, so she got one for Christmas. There, there are a few issues. W one is, there is a, there's, there's a huge social anxiety uh, associated with having social media all the time and you've, you've got to watch that. You can't let them have these phones in their bedroom, you can't let them look at them all the time because if someone hasn't replied or if someone, you know, then, then there's an anxiety there. And then the second thing is um, you have to make sure kids know what the dangers are. We, we, we can't assume that we can keep them safe from everything and part of the what we need to be doing is teaching them where the risks are, what they should look out for and how they should manage themselves online. And then the third thing is the social media companies need to take a lot more responsibility for what is on their platforms and the government 
don't need to legislate for this because there's some really nasty stuff out there and we can't protect our kids all the time yeah. and that needs to be tackled. The woman at the back there, yes. As a young person, I had a phone from the age of 11, mainly for safety, but also because I wanted to communicate with my friends. And for a lot of children, that is the way it is. And mainly for children as well. It sounds quite weird, but they are more coy of the dangers that are facing them than people know. Like, I knew what I was facing when I was about 14, 13. I wasn't going to go text some, like, 30-year-old man or someone who looked creepy. I know, you know what you're doing. It's not as plain cut as people think it is. Right. M Minette? Well, I, I think that point is, is really, really relevant, actually. I think young people now are so savvy. Um, I think education uh, on, on social media is, is transformed to what it was even a few years ago. Um, but I think seven is, is far too young. I held off with my children until they were using public transport, and then I let them have a phone. I look forward to meeting Jeff's 17-year-old <laughs> son without a phone. I don't think that will happen. So I think well, forty percent. I mean, the one the thing for that stat is obviously a lot of parents are managing. Obviously, I'm not saying not forever. I just think seven's incredible. I agree. Right? I agree. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a safety. We want to be in contact with our children. We want to be able to know that our children can contact us. And you know, I think eleven is is a is a fair age. All right. There's a woman. You, you look very keen to talk. You've got your hand right up there. Yeah. No, a bit further back. That's it. Yes. Yeah. I would class a mobile phone for a youngster as a drug. And I don't really think we understand that drugs take different forms. And it's not just about drugs in nightclubs and in our social... You know, so it's arena. mobile phone use as a kind of addiction? It's an addiction. It, it, it develops a dependency. I've seen it in my great-nephews. They get the, this equipment, they get it in front of their faces, and they learn the culture of needing it from the moment they wake up until they go to bed. And okay. can we not see this as a drug issue that actually needs to be addressed as a, a really serious issue that's going to develop a dependency mm. in later life? James, we haven't got much time left, but, but, but briefly, are you concerned about the, the young, the, the, the decreasing age which kids I, are using for mobile phones? I, I didn't see that report, actually, but um, I, I, seven shocks me. Um, having that having that number of, uh, of, of children that young um, I think that um, I hear what you're saying about about young people being more savvy and I think there is a generation you know digital natives you know people who are much more used to living their lives in social media but in the same way that my kids you teach them about road safety you teach them about um, just being a bit careful I had a very awkward dad conversation about you know, reminding them that what you upload and send to your friends never, ever, ever goes away. And I, and I said, if you don't fancy having a picture perhaps brought up during a job interview in 20 years' time, perhaps don't take it and send it to someone. So, you, so I, I had to have some of those very awkward conversations. Sarah is right. We do need to uh, look at social media companies, and the online harms bill will, uh, will look at that. Uh, and we do have to be very conscious about social pressure, addiction, online bullying. There's a lot wrapped up in this. Yeah. I think mobile phones are an inevitable part of modern life. I don't want to get rid of them. But we've just got to be careful, okay. as with so many other things. We could keep talking about this, couldn't we? Because you've got lots of hands up. I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, I'm so sorry. Our hour is up. Uh, let me remind you that next week we will be in Harpenden, uh, and the week after that we'll be in Dundee. So do come and join us. Call 0330 if you'd like to be in the audience, or go to the Question Time website and you can follow the instructions there. And if you'd like to carry on the conversation, as we clearly could in here, you can join Adrian Charles and guests on Question Time Extra Time, which is on Five Live right now. But it just remains for me to say thank you very much to the panel. Thank you so much to all of you. I'm sorry I couldn't get round more of you. And, of course, thank you to you at home for watching and listening. From Buxton, bye-bye. Well, as you know, tomorrow Britain leaves the EU. One last time, the team makes sense of it all. One final Brexit guest follows next on BBC One.